The Remainder by Monks. In a poorly lit surveillance room, the detective sits in front of a black and white freeze frame of a five-year-old girl leaving a clothing store. She's holding hands with who appears to be her grandmother. The woman is wearing a large brim summer hat and a dark colored dress. He hits play on the VCR and the two casually walk off the screen to the right. Roughly 20 seconds later, a woman runs out of the same store, frantically looking around. This was the young girl's mother, yelling hysterically for her little girl. The sound quality is poor, but you can see and hear the distress. The detective would rewind the footage several times, making sure to catch every detail. He was able to pause on the one frame in which the woman glanced up at the camera. One frame where her large hat did not hide her face. Although, she did have on large sunglasses. Older lady for sure, rather skinny, maybe 60. The detective sat back in the chair. This woman is basically in disguise. Even the loose dark colored dress hid her figure. So was this premeditated? It was starting to appear so. It still doesn't make sense why the little girl was holding this woman's hand so naturally. Five-year-olds usually have a good defense mechanism against strangers called screaming. A reasonable assumption here was that the child knew this person. The devastated mother stated that her daughter, Chrissy, was the more cautious kind of child and would never walk off with anyone, let alone a stranger. The mother did see the woman in the store and it wasn't someone she knew. The detective again watched the woman and Chrissy walk off the screen. He switched over to the second VCR that recorded their continued path. He pressed play and waited, but they never entered the screen. Was he on the wrong timestamp? The detective motioned for the mall security to come over and double check. He was reassured that it was right. So why haven't they entered camera two yet? The detective asked. The security guard looked perplexed. I have no idea, sir. But he heard the faint, staticky screams of the panicked mother, so it had to be the right time frame. He can see other mall goers turn their heads in the direction of the screaming. The detective asked, are there any exits between camera one and two? The guard rubbed his chin to think. The impatient detective got up and said, never mind, son. I'll just go take a look. The detective stood in front of the clothing store, taking in the environment. Two uniformed officers come up to him and he gives them instructions for interviewing surrounding stores. As they walked off, he finally went inside the clothing shop. One of the clerks said she did see the woman with the large hat leave with the child and with a tinge of guilt, had to add that the little girl seemed perfectly fine walking out with the woman. He asked the manager to see the surveillance and was led into the back room. They only had one camera with a fisheye lens that captures the entirety of the small store. The camera was positioned right above the back room door, top corner of the ceiling. On the footage, to the left of the screen, we see a long straight row of racks extending almost the length of the shop. In the middle of the shop are several circular racks of various styles. We can see the mother in the middle of the store going through one of those circular racks and Chrissy in her little puffy jacket and beanie faithfully attached at her mother's hip. She was fiddling with what appears to be a rag doll. They were the only customers in the store and being that it was a little past noon on a Tuesday, the entire mall itself had little traffic. At the very back of the footage is the front of the store. You can see the large windows viewing out into the mall and the wide open double door entrance. And then, you see the woman with the large brim hat walk into the screen from the left. The footage is a bit distorted from that distance, but the detective could see her figure stop. As if she's looking into the store, as if she's window shopping and sees something she likes. She begins to walk again and enters. The detective's eyes began to strain as he squinted, trying to take in every detail. 
The woman started on the opposite side of the long rack of clothing on the left. He can see her hand jut out to rustle the passing fabric as she made her way down the aisle. At one point, you can see the mother momentarily turn and notice the woman and then right back to sifting as the woman casually made her way down the rack. The detective's instincts told him that something was off. The manager and the clerk could be seen discussing something in the far right corner, not paying attention. But if they did, like the detective was now, they would have seen that the woman was not there to shop at all. The woman's gaze remained on her victims no matter where she moved to, and that was creepy in itself, but there was something about the way she moved that was so strange, so fluid. Her legs were walking, but something felt disconnected in the motion, like she was superimposed into the footage. The detective watched with bated breath as she moved closer to the camera. He could make out the lower half of her face now, weathered with wrinkles, a smoker possibly. At this angle, he can see that she is very gaunt and began walking down the other side towards her intended target. As the woman neared them, she turned her head back to the clothes so as to appear normal and when she was next to them, she stopped. A five foot gap separated the old woman's back and Chrissy. The mother was still sifting with her back to the woman as well. But Chrissy, who appeared to be holding on to the belt loop of her mother's jeans, had taken notice of the woman. The large brim hat slowly turned towards Chrissy. And when I say turning, I mean just her head. Her body remained facing the clothes rack, arms still pretending to sift through it. As the hat kept turning, it reached a most unnatural, neck-breaking degree. It finally stopped when her fucking head was completely backwards and looking directly down at the child. In one quick motion, her body whipped around and immediately knelt down to the child's height. They're now face to face. The woman's right hand reaches out as if to ask for a handshake. Chrissy doesn't move. The woman with her left hand then takes off her sunglasses. And that's when Chrissy, as if in recognition, slipped her finger out of her mother's belt loop and took a step towards the woman, taking her outreached hand. The woman stood upright placed her sunglasses back on and walked out with Chrissy. <sighs> the detective took a sudden gulp of air. He had completely forgotten to breathe. Regardless, there was no way to gather himself from what he just saw. He was a man that dealt with facts and now his reality was practically shot to shit. Unless he could explain this, he comes out of the back room piecing his brain back together. He approaches the store employee that saw them leave. He had her reenact the scene. The girl, pretending to hold an invisible child's hand, walked at a normal pace out of the store and turned left. The detective started counting to 20. He would then run outside to tell the employee to stop. He walked towards her, panning around to find an escape, an exit of any sort. But there was nothing. The detective stood in the middle of the semi-busy mall, scratching his head in frustration. A teenage girl working a toy kiosk was eyeing him. Their eyes met, and the detective walked over all the while revealing his badge. He asked if she saw an elderly woman with a large brim hat walking with a five-year-old girl earlier at 12.15. She responded she hadn't, because she would have been at the lunch court anyhow. As she was answering him, she saw pure alarm jump into his eyes. It scared her and she moved away from him. A realization had popped into his head. He suddenly steps a few feet back and under his breath, he murmurs. Where the fuck was this kiosk in camera two? This was a blind spot. 
the detective's eyes landed on a basket of stuffed animals for sale, and laying amongst them, out of place, was a worn-out rag doll. And then he saw the two-door compartment below, made to store inventory big enough for a five-year-old. He knelt down and grabbed the handles. His heartbeat was now thumping in his ears. He opened it and found himself paralyzed. The teenage girl walked around. Her curiosity got the best of her. She looked over his shoulders and let out a piercing scream. The body of five-year-old Chrissy was laying inside, pale and cold to the touch, with a large brim summer hat resting on top of her. A crowd began to gather. The detective knew he had to control the scene. He began ordering the people to step back as he made the call to his men. He was in the process of dialing for forensics when he heard a little voice ask, What's going on? The detective turned around and was literally almost scared to death. Chrissy was sitting upright and looking directly at him. She was alive. But there was something about her eyes. There was a darkness around them, contrasted even more by her pale skin. Maybe that's just how she looked. But those eyes, they were vacant, cold, expressionless. There was something wrong. Hell, there was something wrong about this whole fucking situation. His men arrived to help disperse the onlookers. Chrissy's overjoyed mother would follow shortly. She hugged her baby and cried. Although, Chrissy's reaction remained muted. The detective stole a quick glance at the two. He was met again with Chrissy's dead eyes, and he immediately had to look away. They never caught the woman. A week later, the detective is in his living room, seemingly going mad. Surveillance footage is playing over and over again on his television. The clip of the old woman in the hat and Chrissy walking away and disappearing in the top corner of the screen. And 20 seconds later, of course, we have a frantic mother rush out screaming her daughter's name to no avail. If you stay on the mother's camera, you will see a few people come to her aid. The detective has gone over this footage countless times, and countless times he would ask, when the hell did the woman do to Chrissy in that blind spot? Yet his gut was telling him something that his brain had yet to put together. He rewound and watched for the 50th time, then the 51st time. Then his brain finally connected something. When the mother comes out and screams, Two employees from the clothing store are first to come to assist her. Three seconds later, a young couple pushing a stroller enters the frame from the left and stops to see what was the matter. Ten seconds after that, a young woman enters from the right. This is where he pauses the video. He stared at this woman, who had just come into frame to offer her assistance. Now, why did she look so out of place? And of course, it's always the easiest answer that sometimes takes so long to see. No shopping bags. No purse. This was not a woman that came to shop. And lastly, it was the middle of winter and all she had on was a dark dress. She would exit the screen to the left shortly after. The resolution was poor, but he scrutinized every pixel of this woman while she was on screen. He strained his eyes until they watered, and finally he saw it. That disconnected walk, leaving the screen. What the fuck is this? His reality really was being shot to shit. He needed a reality check. He picks up his phone and calls the mother to get an update on Chrissy. When the mother hears his voice, she immediately breaks down. She confesses that she doesn't believe it's her Chrissy that she had brought home. It's some thing that just observes her eyes when they look at me. It doesn't 
It doesn't even feel like she knows that I'm her mother. And she has these dark circles around her eyes that were never there before. And they seem to be getting darker every day. It's, it's like something had taken my Christy and left me with a shell. When they hung up, he sat down with his head in his hands. What the hell happened in that blind spot? Then, a woman's voice whispers in his ear and startles him to the very core. She said, You're old. Not much I can take. But I don't like nosy people. The detective is left sitting in his living room. The colors of life drained and dark circles began to grow around his eyes. He breathes, he mimics life, but she took the remainder.